Hello, everyone. Happy Friday to you. Happy Good Friday to each of you, especially for those of you who celebrate the Holy Week and this is Easter weekend. So glad to have all of you here with us today. I'm Dr. Nika White. My pronouns are she, her, and I am so privileged to serve as the founder and lead principal consultant for NWC. And it is our organization that brings this Intentional Conversations podcast to the broader community week after week. And it is such a joy to do so. We thank you for being here with us today. We don't take that lightly. It's always such a joy to know that people find value in the content that we are providing through this platform. And so we want to extend a very special welcome to each of you. If you would go to the chat, let us know where you are joining the conversation from today. We love to see all the many different states represented. And even there's a lot of folks that may join us from time to time from outside of the US, and that is equally exciting. So we'd love to see you here in whatever capacity from whatever geographies. And if you feel inclined to be connected to this community beyond this window of time together today, then please also feel free to share your LinkedIn information into the chat. That lets us know that we can reach out and connect with you, and this community certainly finds value in staying connected even beyond this window of our podcast show. At NWC, we really do value disability inclusion, so I want you all to know that we have closed caption that has been enabled for those who may benefit from it, so make sure that you are aware of that. And here at NWC, we also share every week that we love to see smiling faces, but we know that sometimes people are joining us in more of an auditory capacity while maybe they're multitasking. And nonetheless, we are glad you are here, but cameras are welcomed and encouraged, but we are just so glad that you've decided to spend this time with us together today. We do have a number of folks that will join us from LinkedIn Live. And so if you're part of that group, we wanna say hello to you. Uh, we are going to be watching the comment section throughout the, the show today. And um, we are bringing in whatever type of comments that you're making, questions that you have into our Zoom chat as well, so that we all can be um, connected throughout this um, learning hour where we're learning with and from each other. So once again, welcome to Intentional Conversations podcast, where we intersect conversations of diversity, equity, and inclusion with leadership and business. So enjoy the show. Let the conversations begin, and that is precisely what we are about to do. If you're just tuning in, you are joining Intentional Conversations podcast, and we're so glad you are here today. We are at the end of March, but we are still in March, and so I will still take every opportunity to make sure that we are leaning into the fact that women contribute so much to our society in so many different ways. And so while Women's History Month is coming to a close, let's not forget the sentiments that have been amplified throughout this month to celebrate, honor, and recognize women that are, quite honestly, doing the darn thing in so many different industries and places and spaces. And um, I hope that you will, you will continue continue to shine light on that. As I mentioned before, it has been Holy Week. Today is Good Friday. So for those of you who celebrate, I certainly want to extend a happy Easter, a happy resurrection. And I um, want to make sure that we are spending time with family as we can. I know that a lot of families come together for this particular holiday. And I hope that you have plans to love on your loved ones this weekend as well, especially considering so much that we have been exposed to this week where many people have lost their lives and are, are, are struggling and grieving. And so I always like to make sure we're leaning into those opportunities to love on those who love us. I have been sharing with this community for quite some time that we have now a total of three LinkedIn learning courses that have been released with myself as the instructor. There are two new ones that are available as of maybe about a month ago. One is navigating AI, artificial intelligence, through an intersectional DEI lens. And um, that one is actually um, really important right now because conversations of AI are continuing to increase, but we have to make sure that we are using those tools, we are developing those tools with a great level of ethical and DEI in mind. And so I want to make sure that's available to you. And then secondly, accountability for leaders all around navigating DEI. And so I hope you'll take advantage of those LinkedIn learning courses. 
for those of you who um, from time to time realize that, you know what, this hour is not available for me to be able to show up live, but I do like the content, or I know of some others who would enjoy having access to the content from Intentional Conversations. We are also available on podcasts, so wherever you like to get your podcast content, you can find us, Intentional Conversations. I like to share that because it helps us to really expand our reach and our audience to those who may not have the chance to join us live. And so um, help us spread the word, and thank you so much in advance. So at this time, before I actually do a formal introduction of today's guest host, I always like to give you a little bit of what you can look forward to in future weeks in terms of our guest co-host. And so kicking us off in April, we have Tara Turk Haynes. And I am so excited because in that Intentional Conversations broadcast, we're going to be discussing equitable hiring practices, embedding DEI into day-to-day -day operations, increasing belonging and inclusion, and also emphasizing the importance of not forgetting about those middle managers in terms of operational success and how data transforms ROI when talking about equitable operations. And then following that Friday, we have Yvonne Austin, who is going to be joining us as well. And we're gonna be talking about power and privilege and how they can be catalysts for greater conversations versus conflict. And so I really look forward to delving into that topic with Yvonne. I hope that you will join us on the 12th. And then following that on April the 19th, the last person that I'll share with you before I'll give our formal introduction of today's guest host is Dr. Shanika McIver. And in that conversation, we're going to be discussing culturally inclusive leadership and lived experience, women and entrepreneurship, something that's very close to my heart, and then Black women in leadership and strategy. And I hope that you will join us for that Intentional Conversations podcast on the 19th. Now, it does me great pleasure to introduce today's guest co-host, and I'm so excited that she has said yes to our invite and that this community is going to be able to be exposed to her voice, her message, and her platform. We never take it lightly when someone says yes to our invitation, and so I'm so grateful one of the things that we do here at the Intentional Conversations podcast is we always will read the full bio of our guest co-host. We do this because it's important to us for our audience to know the accolades, the credentials, the experiences in which our guest co-host shows up to the conversation. And so today will be no different. Tiffany Castaño is CEO and founder of, and I'm going to give the full name, um, Cultivating the Evolution of Professional HR. So um, and that's an LLC. It's a woman and minority owned boutique human resources and cultural consulting firm based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, CEPHR supports small to mid-sized businesses across the United States and across industries to build strong infrastructures, employer brands, and cultures. Tiffany is passionate about creating equitable workplaces and communities, strong infrastructures, and employer brands and cultures, which is why her business has been founded on those three key principles. Tiffany's why is supporting others to reach their top potential, and she enjoys sharing her knowledge, heart, mind, and conversation to make sure others don't feel excluded or have to struggle if she can share her time or resources to make it easier for them. Co-author of a children's book called Can a Zebra Change Its Stripes? Tiffany's writing inspires children to embrace difference, uncover the importance of acceptance, and learn what it means to make diversity a strength. We have to start them out young. Tiffany was presented with the Jefferson Award in December of 22 for her volunteerism, leadership, and service to community. Tiffany was also recently honored with the Curio 412 Powered by Purpose Award that recognizes businesses whose efforts of philanthropy and or social enterprise improve the community, our region, and beyond. So if you've been with this for quite some time, you know that nor normally what I do at this point is I will stop sharing my screen. I will bring our guest co-host into the spotlight, and I will invite all of you to find those accolades, find those emojis, find those words of affirmations to welcome our guest co-host today, Tiffany Castaño. And Tiffany, welcome. So glad you're here. Before I release you, you. to greet this audience <laughs> in your own way. There is a tradition here on the Intentional Conversations podcast, and that is to ask our guest co-hosts to, as they are greeting us, to share with us something that we would not know about them from reading their bio, as we just did, or from looking at their LinkedIn profile. So welcome, my friend. Thank you for being here, and we're so glad to be in conversation today. 
Thank you. I'm so excited to have this opportunity. Thank you for the invite, Dr. Nika. And it's been great partnering with you all already. Thank you, everyone who is here and already lighting up the chat from where you're joining from. And let's see. Um, so you might notice I have these fun earrings. And uh, when my husband met me, he said that I was the woman. He always knew where I would be in the room because I was always the woman with the biggest earrings. So I do love some flair in my earrings. I love to accessorize and um, I love to be all matchy matchy. So that makes me happy. It lights me up and it brings joy into my world. And uh, I use she, her, ella pronouns, ella Spanish for um, she, her, if you're not familiar. I, I love that. And so as someone who also really values big earrings, I, I'm a big earring gal too. So listen, I, that certainly resonates with me. You can probably barely see mine today, but I'm rocking like the big hoops, but it's because of the background, yes. but um, I do, I do have them on. So, okay. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so let's jump right in. I would love for you to share your journey. I think it's important for this audience to kind of understand how did you matriculate into the work that you do right now? So what was the inspiration that served as the catalyst for you deciding you wanted to um, be a founder, first and foremost, some um, Black woman entrepreneur, but then also just the nature of which you decided you wanted to plant your skill sets to be able to have offerings to others? Thank you so much for that invitation. And Really, you know, I, I often, you know, in half jest say that this was my PPP, uh, but not like the loan, my pandemic passion project, because I <laughs> took a step back. <laughs> I needed to just breathe from all the employee relations. I've been in HR for 16 years, came into it because I wasn't having the best employee experience and felt like I'm a woman of faith. I felt like there was this just push from God to say, you're ready. It's time to do something more and make some big impact. You have sat inside these organizations that haven't always celebrated and elevated your voice. And so it's time for you to, to go out, spread your wings, spread your mission um, and walk your purpose. And that just really kind of caught me by surprise as these things <laughs> often do um, in, in our faith journey. But it really was just this calling that something was always tugging at me like you have to do more, you, you're you meant to do more to expand the reach of helping build strong cultures. And really that's what it's been for me. Um, I have this mission of wanting to HR to be moving from transactional to transformational. And that that is just resonant within me. Both of my degrees, my background are in HR. So it is a love of that. But over the course of the years, what I found is we really needed some better cultures. We need to start treating folks better. There are so many different ways that happens. And so I found myself founding this company saying, oh, okay, I'm going to take a little break from what I'm doing right now in my traditional HR leadership role. And so I took a couple months off, helped some friends contract, and it just never really turned off. And my husband was like, I think you're doing this, you know, you, you could probably do this part-time and look, I was looking for another traditional role. And so I'm like, okay. And then he's like, I actually think you can do this full time. So was really blessed that things just started taking off. And I got to work with clients who I really enjoy, who care about people first cultures. Yeah, people first cultures. Um, I think that that is something that we need to continue to amplify because we are seeing high rates of um, employee burnout. We are seeing high rates of um, individuals kind of leaving um, roles that are focused on equity and inclusion um, and, you know, really building healthy cultures because of the burnout. And so we definitely have to make sure we're continuing to amplify that message. And um, I just want to take a moment before I go further into kind of your journey and your history and, and how you like to show up to this work. I want to acknowledge what has been on top of mind for so many of us this week. We saw um, the the bridge in um, Baltimore, a very common bridge that many people would travel day in and day out that was hit by a cargo ship. And there are people that lost their lives. There are still people that are um, being um you know, search for, and it's just, it's heartbreaking. So I want to acknowledge and extend condolences to all of those who are, um, have loved ones that have been impacted by that tragedy. 
But what is even more disheartening is that on the heels of that tragic news that all of us have been, you know, bear witness to, um, we also have had a lot of um, individuals who are of the persuasion that there's no value in DEI to use that as a chance to um, to further create division and untruths about DEI. And and I don't know about you, Tiffany, but um, as a as a practitioner in this space that really cares about, you know, being human centered first and care about, um, you know, equal opportunity, leaving no one behind. I found it to be hurtful. It really was hurtful. You know, there's a lot that kind of rolls off my shoulder because I'm like, I'm called for this, right? I'm a woman of faith as well. I do believe that the work that I do is part of my calling and my purpose. So I'm suited and I'm, I can do this. I have probably a larger amount of emotional capacity to do the work. And I think sometimes that's required. But today, this week, I am sitting in a lot of hurt because of how DEI has been weaponized and um, relegated to now all of these hate words. And um, and it's, it's just so disheartening. And so I just want to kind of leave space for you and I to be in community with the rest of those who are joined here with us today, just to think about... Um, uh, you know, how do we process this? How do we find ways to continue to maintain hope, which has been my message the whole time? You know, I keep saying that um, hopelessness gets us nowhere. So we have to continue to maintain some sense of hope, but it does get hard. And so first, how are you processing? And um, mm. and just share some sentiments and thoughts that are coming up for you as you've been processing all of the events of the week. Thank you so much for that. I Holding space is just is something that I think those of us in this space and who understand people first cultures and 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 just hold that space for people in the world understand the importance of that. I've done a lot of yeah. that this week and it does get hard. It gets exhausting uh, depending on what intersectionalities you live at. It yeah. sometimes you just feel like you're constantly trying to you're constantly trying to overcome something and it, it is exhausting or you're you're having to educate or you may be the go-to person with this. And I've had some conversations with folks to be able to hold space for what this is doing to the economy um, with, with the bridge, the, the attacks on DEI, the bans on our books. It just seems to, attacking women's reproductive rights, it, it just never seems to stop. Um, and so one of the greatest things we can do is what you've done today is just open up the space and hold the space. I think we yeah. have to give grace to ourselves, um, to give ourselves that space, to not necessarily always feel like we have to be uh, scrolling social media, which can be a lot. We have to have self-care within that too. So it's, it can be a lot. So thank you for honoring some space for that. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I also think that it's important to acknowledge that, um, you know, sometimes we uh, are also able to find some silver lining and some opportunities to become better humans when these tragic situations occur. And so one thing that I am pleased about is I'm seeing the heightened awareness of additional safety concerns to be implemented, um, particularly for a lot of the immigrants that, you know, work in construction and work the bridge and things of that nature. And so I'm hoping that that is not going to um you know, be in vain. I'm hoping that those who have sparked the conversation or continue to amplify that as a point will be able to, um, you know, really just mobilize people around thinking more intently about that so that we're moved to action. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you for that space. <laughs> Now, now I want to ask you, so I've given the full name of your company, Cultivating the Evolution of Professional HR. How do you refer to the actual acronym of it? Do you say C-E-P-H-R or do you... I I call it Sefer. So Sefer. Okay. Sefer. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't call it what you call it. I'm all about branding, right? So I'm like, I want to call it what she calls it, Sefer. Okay. So here we go. So I want to talk about Sefer a little bit. How do you specifically tailor your services at Sefer to cater to all of the unique needs of small to mid-sized businesses across different industries? I think sometimes we feel like we have to um, have a very specific niche that only locks us into a specific industry, but I think there's a lot of value into being able to be fluid um, and provide services that are of value to many different size organizations and industries. And so how have you been able to, to tailor your services to do just that? 
I appreciate that. Thank you. And I, Zephyr always, I always say it's, it's Zephyr like Zephyr. Um, Zephyr, but some people pronounce it different, but the beauty of it is that it's very, you know, our stories come to life when we, when we have these opportunities and when we get curious and we ask, actually ask questions. So I find that it becomes a conversation starter, which is, which is important. Um, and it is an acronym for cultivating the evolution of professional HR. So um, kind of it came about because I was like, well, you know, I wanted all these words that, that moved HR and that seemed like we were, you know, culture forward people first. And I yeah. was struggling to find a name, which I thought would be the easy part and it wasn't. Um, and so uh, I had talked to somebody in marketing and they said, well, you know, my company name is an acronym. And so really it represents what I want HR to be uh, and how we can really be a support to the people and the culture and the leadership and really help them build solid culture. Yeah. So for me, that is also how I practice. It's how we customize everything with our clients. It involves a lot of deep listening. It involves uh, meeting them where they're at because not every, every businesses are of different sizes. While I support small to medium businesses, they each have different needs. They're all different industries or across the United States. Um, I leverage different partnerships that I have to work with them. And so every project is custom and unique. One of the, the, the things that we just did today that is unique to how I serve my clients and how the team does is that we do hold space. I have people who come to me and we scrap our agenda because they, you know, maybe they're in tears, something happened. We have to meet the person first. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's very important to me. It's not just about, we have to get this project done. I have people in tears. I have people, you know, both of the client side, I've held space for partners. They've done the same for me. And so it's really about understanding, I get it. I'm a small business owner and a minority business yes, owner yes. myself. So I understand the challenges right. and, and that listening helps really support uh, that as I do the work with them. Yeah, yeah. No, I always say I think the act of listening is one of those leadership skills that um, we we probably as leaders should lean into more. It's definitely something that mm -hmm. we have to build up and strengthen our, our skill sets around because it's not something that just happens, you know, organically all the time. So I can't help but to think as you, Tiffany, were just talking about how you like to show up to this work, specifically how um, CFER, your company, likes to support clients in this work. But when I think about the name of cultivating the evolution of professional HR, it brings to mind that you certainly felt that there was a need to evolve the way that mm -hmm. HR was being done, right? And so I want you just to lean into that a little bit more and help us to understand your philosophy about maybe the old traditional HR and how, um, from your vantage point, there was um, there was impetus for we need to cultivate evolving this because obviously that's where you landed. Yes. Oh, thank you for that space too. <laughs> this is one of my passion topics. I get so fired up. Um, it really is. And I had to have a hard conversation last week um, because I was like, this isn't how this is meant to be. Part of my role as an HR consultant is to help my clients where when they build, most of them don't have an HR uh, person or department because they're too small. Um, and so my job is also to help them build it right, to have the seat be where it belongs in the organization so that we're yeah. thinking about it strategically. Now, when I when it came into HR, I came in and into like the old guard, if you speak, if you say so, of like policies, procedures, everything right. was more punitive. It was very, it was payroll, right? It was your compliance focus uh, from the industrial revolution, but it has evolved. And there are folks like me who are disruptors, who we will, we will be out there advocating for the right thing, being the right thing. Uh, and so for me, I don't want people to fear HR. There's been over the yeah. course of the years, a fear that organizations, and when we talk about these structures um, and how they oppress, it really happens from a place of these power structures where it, it even HR was weaponized against employees or even against leaders. And so I have always practiced that we're all in this together as an HR business partner, really understanding the needs of the business, setting meeting cadences right. aside so I could just hear and be there for them. Um, and people always tell me, you, you're you you're a different kind of HR. You practice differently. And I'm like, there are lots of us out here. Um, but people have had some poor experiences, self-included, which is how I got into HR. I just chose to use that as a superpower. Um, but we yeah. have a long way to go, but we have come along 
way as yeah. well. I would definitely agree to that. I have seen the uh, evolution of of how HR is being practiced and thought about. And I, I can't say that what I've seen, though, has been a result of it just kind of happening organically. I think that the world has forced, you know, mm -hmm. HR professionals to think um, more intently about what is the totality of the value they can bring to organizations outside of just the traditional role and scope. Of work, and so um, I am. I'm always happy when I can um, have folks in my network that are of the persuasion that yes, you know, we, we do need to make sure we're kind of expanding the horizon of what HR entails and what it looks like. So as I as I think about that, what strategies, Tiffany, do you often recommend for organizations who are aiming to authentically diversify their teams to cultivate inclusion, an inclusive culture, to make sure that they are moving beyond. Uh, mere performative actions, which we know there's a lot of criticism around that these days uh, across, mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for against many organizations. So how do you like to guide your clients in that regard? Yes, I think, you know, I always share, we talked about empathy and empathetic leadership. I think mm -hmm. leaders leaning into their own vulnerability and not feeling yes. like they have to have all the answers. Just, we really have to, at its core, bring humanity back to the workplace that, Leaders aren't perfect. They they can be subject to burnout and all of these things as well. But really one of the things that I'm starting to see as more trending is outreach. Uh, people are understanding that they can't just post and ghost. Um, just like we tell people in marketing on social media, you can't just post something and then run away. We have yeah. to really be engaged in the process and we yes. need to do that proactively. So the proactive piece is something I work with guiding clients on often because and in the nature of my work, and this is kind of how we got into this transactional space, sometimes there are things that surface that we have to be transactional about. We just have to right. react, I should say. Um, but people got so comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so being proactive, one of the other great strategies is getting to the root of things. I think when we recognize that there's feedback on the other side of something, when we recognize that there's a hard conversation and maybe we feel not equipped as a leader, it can be scary for people and they shy away from it, but it only makes the situation worse. So I tell people, have those hard conversations, um, understand, come from a place of assuming positive intent. Um, we don't need to do toxic positivity, but to really be in a place of listening with your heart um, and not having an outcome in mind is really yeah. supportive to that that process. Um, but we have to get to the root of things or it's just going to keep repeating itself. And that's totally still agree. an area of opportunity <laughs> that I see out yeah. there. I, I totally agree. I talk often about how um, I, I, I think that it's so important for us to, to be willing to peel back all the layers, identify those root causes of issues that could be compromising a healthy culture, inclusion, equity, you know, all the things that um, a, an environment needs to be able to have people that feel like they can show up at their best. And if we don't do that, we're going to continue to find ourselves addressing all of these big challenges uh, with surface solutions that, you know, may make us feel good for a moment to feel like we're just doing something, but is it impactful, mm -hmm. right? Is it really driving towards some type of, of change that's going to impact impact the organization positively. And so I'm totally with you on that. Um, this brings me to my next question. I think that when we talk in general about privilege, right, there's so much negative connotation around that word. Mm -hmm. And often when I show up to conversations and I'm introducing, you know, sources of power and privilege and how it relates to allyship and to equity and, and all the things, I always feel compelled to share that you know, there is, there's this broad definition of privilege, but then, you know, does not take away from the fact that also white privilege does exist. It is a thing and it does exist, right? And so when I talk about it from a broad perspective, I challenge people to think about, you know, the areas of their lives. And if they were to really take inventory of their lives, many of us could probably name um, a number of things that has given us an advantage, not having anything to do with anything that we've done, but just the cards that we were dealt. So like I often say, I grew up in a home with both parents. My parents are still in a, a loving, you know, relationship today. I'm a well able body individual. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on. The importance of acknowledging and recognizing those sources of privilege um, is important for those of us who are advocating and champion for leaving no one behind, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but it does not, again, take away from the fact that 
white privilege does exist. It does not mean that white people do not have burdens or hardships that they have to endure or navigate. It just means that the color of their skin is not a reason for it. So I would love for you to share with our vodcast community how um, you like to coach individuals around leveraging their privilege to create opportunities for others who may not always have equitable access. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad we're talking about this because it yeah. is, that's just one of those heavy topics that people yes. just, I mean, you mentioned privilege and people are, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I do, mm -hmm. you know, we, I, I am fortunate that I can run a business and that it's thriving and um, mm -hmm. for the neighborhood, I live in lots of things um, to be loved by my family. So privilege, it does not have to be a dirty word. And for me, um, really with like with clients is helping them understand that you mentorship is important and certainly sponsorship. Speak up those names of folks who right. typically wouldn't have access or opportunity in the rooms. And I think there's this people it sounds cute, right? To have a mentorship program, but are you yeah. really doing it? And how are folks impacted? Are you leveraging the data that you have in your organization to also feed into that um, professional development? One trend that I'm seeing with clients is that they're really looking further into who is getting these opportunities when we say, right. hey, we have this stipend. Um, and it's also just making sure that the right folks are getting opportunities. So talent benchmarking and succession planning are important because when we look at we know that the hierarchy, the higher you go in the organization, that is less and less diverse. Absolutely. If it's diverse at all, same with our boardrooms. And so having the opportunity to build people from all levels, we are all self-led, but uh, I consider us all leaders from my perspective, yeah. but to be able to uplift folks who typically wouldn't have those opportunities and do you have the right systems in place? Are you honest with yourself about what that that looks like and the privileges of leaders that you have in this position of power and authority. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's important to also highlight the fact that um, where it starts at the organizational level and in, in terms of really trying to create a sense of equity um, and thinking about the intersection of power and privilege is to be willing to collect the data. You touched on this a little bit, but you have to know what does what does the data say, right? And what does the data say once it's disaggregated across the many different populations of employees that you have? Because usually that's when a different story or narrative will surface. And that mm -hmm. sometimes can serve as just the motivation that's needed to drive the change. You know, it's like bring the data, bring the data. And so I, I just wanted to bring that to the conversation. Now, we talked before about how your company, you work with organizations of different sizes. And sometimes there is this myth that if I'm a small organization, I don't need to be concerned about diversity, equity, and inclusion because that's for those big corporations that have deep pockets, right? They need to be doing all those things. And, you know, I'm sure you and I both are the persuasion that that is a myth and that's that's not correct. There's so mm -hmm. many different levels and degrees of how in which we show up to this to this work. Um, and it is, is certainly a responsibility of, of all of us as business owners and people that are um, leaders within organizations to help facilitate that. But when you are asked by a small company or organization that's starting at ground zero um, around, you know, their DEI journey, and they say, I just don't know where to start. I know I hear that a lot. It's like, I don't know where to start. Where do we start? And sometimes I want to just say, just start. Sometimes you just have mm -hmm. to start because not <laughs> starting, it's just continuing to perpetuate that, you know, nothing's being done. But what are those kind of immediate first step opportunities that you feel like are really foundational to helping an organization set itself up for success around its DEIB journey. Yeah, and this is, you know, it gets back to what we talked about, about how I tailor it too, because while, uh, you know, my, my craft, if you will, is HR um, mm -hmm. and now more even niched into culture, um, I do fold DEIB into everything I do. So I may be yeah. hired just for the DEIB portion, but regardless if I'm looking at a handbook, we're talking performance, leadership development, whatever it is, you're choosing a software, I'm always going to look at it from that um, from that perspective. And so it, I agree with you, just start. People have to understand, like you're not gonna always get it right. And I think there's also a myth that, you know, folks like us who practice DEIB, right. that we always get it right. So right. you're gonna make mistakes, <laughs> you're gonna, but those are your best lessons. So 
just starting the journey, understanding how it connects to your mission, vision, values. Who do you say you are? Are you walking your talk yeah. and, and exploring that? And I've had the opportunity to unpack that and have somebody like rework their values because they're like, we're not even really doing these. Like, where do we start? Right. So I'm like, okay, that recognition and awareness is a great place to start. Just start mm -hmm. there, involve your team, ask them, you know, how they hold them and see how, you know, is, is the thing that we think and say we're doing, is that, that what it is? And if not, start to unpack that and explore what it could look like if it was if it was different. I would say policies are huge. It is amazing yes. to me that how much gendered language I still see, um, or even when you look at ability, some of the language that's in our handbook still. Um, right. So I would encourage people to look at that because trust me, if you don't, your employees will bring it to you. And I've seen that happen. Like, hey, wait a minute. Why does this handbook say this? So really just taking a step back and, and understanding who are you trying to be? What do your customers and suppliers expect of you? You can start with like, who, who's in your neighborhood, right? Well, who are the communities? Where are y'all ordering your lunch from? And start right. to diversify that way. It's little things that really add up. But asking mm -hmm. questions and getting curious is a great way to start too. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Curiosity can can really serve as well. Um, but you said something that was really profound, you know, which is sometimes the genesis is literally just to um, be clear about how does this work connect to your mission, vision, and values, right? And then that <laughs> in and of itself, you know, is probably going to reveal a lot about um, how you need to be engaged, you know, in this in this type of work. And then the other thing you talked about were looking at the policies and reviewing handbooks. I too am equally surprised at the number of organizations that we will maybe encounter or work with. And as we start to really dig deep into deepening their um, commitment to DEI, we start looking at some of their policies. It's like, what was the last time you updated your handbook, your employee <laughs> handbook or success guide? You know, they're, they're called different things. And yeah. it's like, we don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that's an easy one, right? That's the yeah. easy one. Hence the cultivating the evolution, right? <laughs> that is an easy one. You know, some of the, the practices that I've seen in handbooks are, um, you know, they are so outdated from a standpoint of how are we defining family? You know, knowing that we live in a multicultural, um, you know, global type of society. And so sometimes family is always reg regulated to just who's in your household, you know, the parents and then the kids. But there are a lot of cultures where family is is deeper than just you know that 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 core it, it includes aunties and uncles and you know grandparents <laughs> and such and so yeah. anyway so when you're thinking about bereavement and but there's so many different to your point small things that um require attention for us to make sure that we're continuing to evolve how in which we're showing up to um this work and so i appreciate you bringing that it looks like you want to jump in and say something else about that tiffany <laughs> i'm just I don't get to have these conversations that often where people understand and even what we call our policies, right? There's still a lot of folks and and I'm not shaming people, right? I, we're not here to sure. do that. But that when, you know, they'll say like maternity or paternity and it's like, well, you know, let's let's think about how what right. message that sends. Um, yes. I'm just so grateful that that for this conversation because um, unless I'm working directly with a client or it's our team, we don't, I don't often have these conversations with folks. So I'm just grateful for, for you bringing <laughs> that forward. I'm really just, it's gratitude. That's what you're seeing here. No. Well, good. I'm glad, I'm glad that this is putting you, putting you into a happy space of conversations that bring you joy. <laughs> yes. That is awesome. Okay. We're going to be shifting it a little bit. I'm going to invite our community to ask questions of our guest co-host today, if you desire. So if you have some curiosities that are coming up for you, then hold that thought. We're going to give you a chance. If you're part of our Zoom community, you can let us know that you're interested in presenting your question by using the raise hand feature. I will call on you, add you to the spotlight, and um, you can do so at that time. Or if you're just kind of listening and you want your question to be considered, then place it into the chat. We'll be happy to try to get to as many of those as we can as time permits. And the same for those of you who are watching on LinkedIn Live. Go to the comment section, add your questions. My team is watching that closely and we'll bring them over here and um, make sure they get presented. Okay, while you're percolating on those questions, I'm going to go to my next question for you, Tiffany. And I want to talk about um, your personal why. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things we were talking about before the top of the hour the show started is how sometimes we have to remember our why when this work gets really, really hard, right? And so um, what drives your passion for supporting others to reach their full potential? Mm. 
it's, you know, this is connected to why Sephir is an acronym because it is always about people. Like since I was little and my late father really, like he was a volunteer at his core. He loved his community. He would do anything for anyone. And I have all the best of his qualities. <laughs> Thank you, God. Um, and he is just, he was just wonderful. And so I understand things differently. Um, I, and he always told me you can do and be whatever you want. And so I feel like to the point that is in my bio, I really live that out because I don't want other people to have to struggle, whether that's a leader, an employee who's having a hard time, maybe they just need a little space because they're willing to have the conversation with their leader, even if it's difficult, but they don't know how to process it. So we do a lot of like, Hey, you know, what is it that you're looking for? you know, offering some guidance and just the psychological safety for them to be a space. My why is really just being that space to listen. I've always been the friend people call um, and they know that I'm going to listen to them and hold that space. And that was important to me to bring into the business too, because I want our organizations to reflect the communities that we live in. I want people to not be harmed when they leave the workplace. Um, I've had some experiences that that ground me further in my why because I have been through a couple depressions from work and I don't want that for other people. So if I feel like I can be a mechanism to helping build the processes, the tools people need, the safety in an organization, I mm -hmm. that is just, it's, it's why I get up every day and do this. Mm -hmm. It really is. No. That is. That is beautiful. I think that should be an exercise for all of us is to be able to answer the question of, of what drives our passion? What is our why for wanting to support others? I think it just helps us to lean in more intentionally to the human aspect of, of, of who we are and how we want to show up for others. And so I'm gonna, gonna challenge this community to do that. And if you happen to know your why, um, for what drives your passion for supporting others to reach their full potential. I know that we have some of those individuals who really believe those sentiments as part of this community. I want you to go to the chat or the comment section and to share that with us. Okay, so Tiffany, I'm not seeing any hands up so far, so I'm going to keep rolling with my questions. But again, the opportunity <laughs> is there. If you have questions, make sure if you're using the raise hand feature, if you're part of our Zoom community, or uh, place them into the chat or the comment section. So I want to talk about podcast that you um that you have and it i think this is a podcast that you are establishing that you've started or either you're planning to start i would love for you to share what topics will it cover um, when can we anticipate this launch anything that you can share with us thank you um this this is also grounded in my why and wanting to give back so it was supposed to i was hoping that it would come out this this quarter but um, I've been blessed with a lot of things going on unexpectedly with Sefer, and so grateful for those opportunities to call to be called to serve there. Um, I'm hoping that by maybe the end of uh, Q2 or Q3, we'll have this podcast launch. But really, it was born out of, I did a talk, a women's empowerment talk in Philadelphia last summer mm -hmm. um, and came back home just inspired. I sat in a room full of women who told their bold, courageous stories on things that are hard to talk about sometimes, especially yeah. as those of us that identify as women. And I was able to just have this space two or three days later. And I was like, I want to start a podcast around this. I want to inspire other people. People kept coming up to me like, I wish my friend could have been up, you know, here while you were on this stage. Aww. She's going through something similar, just telling our very human stories, very raw and emotional. So I want it to be a space where I can share a little knowledge, just quick bits of knowledge um, and backstory for people. Cause I also get people who email me or show up in my DMs saying, yeah. thank you for that post. It inspired me and they can't often talk about that out loud. So that's who it's for. And I'm, I'm excited to start framing up some episodes. <laughs> but we are excited for you and really do look forward to that coming to fruition so that we can support you in that endeavor. Mm -hmm. Um, so thank something you. that has already uh, launched is the fact that you've co-authored a children's book. I talked about this when I was reading your bio. And uh, tell us what inspired you to write that children's book. And I'm going to go back to see the name of it. Can a zebra change its stripes? Mm -hmm. I love that. Tell us about this book. Oh, thank you. I love reading this too. My little ones in my in my mm -hmm. life, and, um, but young ones and adults like it too. So this <laughs> was uh, the very start of the pandemic. Uh, the co-author, Juliet Winningham, she actually sent me a DM on LinkedIn and was like, I really love the values you show up with. I love how you write and just how human you seem. And I'd love for you to endeavor on this project. 
with me. And I was like, me? It's like, do you have the right person? I literally thought she meant to send it to someone else. Um, <laughs> and so as we started this journey, I'm a huge advocate of, of mental health. And so I was planning to start it around that. And then the murder of George Floyd happened. And I went to her and said, I, I would like this book to address the inequities in the world and to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And she was like, absolutely. I would expect you to use your platform for that. And so switched it up. And it really looks at, you know, we use this fun, playful, like they're in the you know, grassy knolls and prairie, um, but dif they, there's difference within um, these, these animals. And there's a superhero of the dog who is a part of each of these uh, series, but really to be able to understand just because you're different doesn't mean we have to treat people different. And it just goes through the lessons of what's learned and how the younger ones are teaching the other generation um, what that looks like. And so it's just a fun little story that is uplifting in that way. I love it. And we did share that into the chat for anyone that's interested. The title alone has me really intrigued. And, um, you know, I, have to say, I think there's a lot that us adults can learn from children's books. You know, they're so s simple in nature, but they can be incredibly impactful in terms of the, the message. And um, um, so I, I love that that's been a part of your, your journey so far is being able to co-author a children's book. And then you also have another collaborative book project that I understand that you're involved in. Are you able to share a little bit about that? A little bit, yeah. So um, that was also born. Thank you for, for bringing that forward. Um, that was born out of the Philly event too, uh, the Women Empowered Women's event where Susan Freeman, who puts that event on or put it, she does every year actually. Um, and so several of us who took the stage that day back in Philly, um, she invited to do this collaborative book. So it's 30 women. It's called Own Your Story, which we did on the stage there. And we're really, it, she saw it as a way to continue to elevate women's stories, um, to help inspire other people, to build community. And so I'm excited for that to come out. And probably in the next couple of months, you'll start hearing a little bit more about that as well. Just a beautiful collection of women I'm grateful to know. I love it. Yeah. And the team is quick today. We have a visual of that. Own own your story, okay. empower, connect, and create change that's been placed into um, the chat. And so, yeah, we hope that you all will take note of these resources and, uh, and support, support, support. Um, and I'm also noticing that someone took me up on my um, my my challenge for sharing your why. I think this came actually directly to me. So I don't know if that was intentional or not. So I won't share who shared it, but I will share what it is. My passion and my why is intertwined with growing up during the era of MLK and his death. He laid down his life knowing he wouldn't get there with us. And from that, I believe I can plant seeds of DEI and organization, even if I won't get there with them. Family members involved in the movement in US and Canada have also been inspirational. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for accepting our challenge Beautiful. and sharing that with this community. Okay. Wow. So, um, we have some time left for questions and I'm going to go to my next question because I don't see any other ones, um, any folks with their <laughs> hands raised right now, but keep them coming if you're percolating right now. So, um, we share that we both are black women entrepreneurs, right? And, um, you know, we probably could have a whole hour long to talk about some of the challenges and just navigating the weight of entrepreneurship and then compounding that with navigating the weight of entrepreneurship as black women. And so I just want maybe um, to, to hold space for all the complexities that I'm sure you have experienced, that I have experienced, probably many that are part of this community have experienced if you are a founder of an organization. But what challenges have you encountered um, or observed in the professional landscape? And, and how are you finding ways to, to process and to um, not let that hinder you? Because obviously you're, you're reaping success now through the work, the impactful work that you're doing with your clients. Thank you. It's hard. <laughs> Sometimes um, one of the best things is to have conversations like this to talk to other founders, to talk to other Black women. So I have very intentional spaces and community that I'm a part of and that I build to offload some of that weight. Um, one of the things that I see and why I was very intentional about not seeking certain funding is because of the disparities that I see. Um, and even in the work that I do uh, and that I've done with partners uh, for events, it's been very hard to seek sponsorship. And you kind of watch who is getting the money where the funding is going uh, and watch us work so hard and pour our everything and network and um, oops, get me a little emotional and, and really struggle 
to yeah. even get a response to yeah. have anybody show up for us. And, and the, the number of times we're expected to do things without pay. So the emotional labor, um, there have been times I've had to chase a few payments, right. Um, or to, or clients to like, come on back. And so really what I would like people to understand is the impacts to really, when we talk about root cause, yeah. um, I have had microaggressions against me while I'm facilitating and well, was hired to D to present a DIB, um, workshop. And so really there's just so much more work to do. Um, when we look at just looking at people as humans, but the reality is, you know, I sit in the skin that I do and in the gender that I do, and it's hard being a small business founder. And I think people don't always understand what they're doing. Um, the language we, we share, there's so much, um, in this client consulting, coaching kind of relationship where, um, because of the structures we live in and because of how society is and how polarized we are as a society where people, they don't often think before they say something. And so I've had right. harm even unexpectedly as a consultant in this space, but then mm -hmm. reconciling that with, and you're still a black woman. And that's just yeah. unfortunately yeah. where it is, right? Yeah, that is, that is so real and it resonates deeply. Um, I'm seeing someone shared into the comments that your comments also resonate with them. And, um, you know, one of the things that I have found as part of, um, you know, navigating this, this, the weight of entrepreneurship as a black woman, this is making sure that I'm doing that in community with others. And so, you know, um, for those of you who found the words that Tiffany just shared as, as something that caused you to feel seen and is maybe commonplace for you, think about who are those individuals you can connect with? You know, maybe it's creating those small brain trust groups or or mastermind groups of other like-minded people and 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 who are uh, maybe of, of similar type of, 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 of challenges that they're navigating as well and to support each other. That has been really tremendous for me. And um and so I, I just want to offer that up for what it's worth to anyone in this community that, again, is kind of listening to this conversation and thinking, yes, been there, felt that, and I'm navigating it present day. Um, we don't have to do this alone. No one is 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 really, no one gets to where they are um, in isolation. And so mm -hmm. I think that having that safe landing place to be able to be vulnerable and just kind of vent and say, here's what I'm experiencing. Have you run up against this? You know, I don't believe in gatekeeping. I think that's the value of having like brain trust groups or mastermind groups. You know, I think there's way too much opportunity out there for all of us to win and we have to protect the full turf. And so um, anyway, just wanted to offer that up to, to you, Tiffany, and anyone else in this community that may find that of value. So um, I, I should let this audience know that Tiffany, you were gracious enough to give us your time today. And what you said to us is that you did have a heartbreak a little bit before the top of the hour for another engagement. And we want to certainly respect and honor that. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this out a little bit early, but I wanna do so giving you the opportunity to share um, what else is coming up for you that maybe you did not get a chance to socialize with this community that you're feeling a lot of energy around and you want to um, put on our radar. I appreciate that. and I think. You touched on uh, that just now is the power of community, community and the power of collectiveness. That is our strength as DEIB continues to be under scrutiny and under threat. And really, we just, especially as entrepreneurs, and we, we forget sometimes that there's a whole community out there. We work so hard on our brands and marketing, all these things, but someone is always out there who has a similar story, a different story, who needs you. And building that community is really impactful. You don't have to do this alone. To Dr. Nika's point, we elevate together. Uh, and that really is a strength. So I just want to, I just want to plus one that. So, and, and just thank you all for your hearts and, and your shares and for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. You're having some some sentiments that are being shared to, for affirmations for you and to the chat. So I hope you take a quick yeah. look at that. But thank you for being with us. Thank you to this community for being with us as well. We hope to see you back next week. Enjoy this weekend. Be safe, everyone. And uh, we just appreciate you being part of our community. So take care. Bye-bye.